take one more question. <laughs> It might year, take one more after that. <laughs> as of last year, Walker Digital has filed over 60 suits against uh, giant firms such as Sony, Microsoft, Amazon, Disney. Um, could you comment on the sheer number of suits, and was that always the case? So no, we're innovators uh, in the number of lawsuits we have filed. Uh, it's very expensive to file lawsuits uh, in the millions of dollars. So you need millions of dollars to do so. Large companies know that, and they're very, they're very uh, well evolved. They're highly evolved. I love large companies. They're very good at what they do. But they're very evolved creatures. And they know that the vast majority of inventors cannot afford to sue them. They can't wait it out. They don't have the kind of deep pockets and patience to sue them. And they take advantage of that fact, as you would if you were a large company, too. So when we approached companies, and we approached many companies early on, and we said, look, you're infringing on our property. Pay us a reasonable license. We don't want to go pay the lawyers millions of dollars. Let's all save ourselves a lot of grief. Their answer, without exception, was, until you sue us, we're not even going to talk to you. So imagine approaching somebody and saying, look, you're on my land. I own this land here. You went and built a house on my land. This is my land. Here's my title. Okay? Would you, look, I, you don't have to knock down your building. Tell you what, pay me some rent. You're on my land. And they say, look, until you drag me to court, I'm not even going to talk to you. Jay, I just want to clarify. You, you say without exception. Without exception. In fact, without it's even worse exception, than that. It's even no worse than one. that. Well, actually, there is one exception. They sued us preemptively. So here's the <laughs> issue. If you ask somebody, if you knock on the door of a company and you say to the company, you're on my land. I'd like you to pay me a royalty for being on my land. The patent law allows them to immediately sue you for asking. Just because you asked, the patent law allows them to preemptively sue you. Now you might say, all right, you were going to sue them anyway. Eh, not so fast. They can sue you in any jurisdiction they choose. So they pick a jurisdiction in the country that is absolutely slower than the slowest glacier. And they sue you there so that you are stuck in that jurisdiction for 10 or 12 years. So what's the incentive for you to knock on their door? Exactly. If you knock, so here's what we did. So you so stopped we said, knocking on doors. No, well, we got smarter. We said, hi, knock, knock, okay? We're not going to tell you which of our 800 patents you're sitting on so that you can't sue us for that, uh, to try to us. We're just going to tell you, would you please read our patent portfolio? Here are the numbers. Would you please just read it? You might notice one or two that you're infringing on. Okay, you have a few lawyers. So, okay. so literally that gets you out of the counter. No, suit. here's what they did. They then sued us under a John Doe lawsuit and said, they didn't tell us which patent, so we're suing them under all of them. And that they can do. No, they tried. We got it thrown out. Okay. So, so even when we tried, okay, so you might say, wow, what kind of system makes it so that inventors have to have millions and millions of dollars and years and years of deep pockets in order to go to large companies and say, come on, you're right on top of this. We really invented this. We did the real work here. You didn't invent it. You could have looked at the patents and seen we invented this. And not only that, we're not going to be crazy people. We want to make a profit. We're willing to take. By the way, your car has about 4,000 patents in it. Your television, probably about 2,000. Your cell phone, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 patents. So all the patent holders happen to be big companies who have all traded trade. with each other. Yeah. But if you, as an inventor, knock on their door, well, you're not part of the club. Oh, we're not paying you. Who do you think you are? So you know, simplistic answers to complex questions are almost never right. There are two sides to every story. There are good things and bad things that happen simultaneously. There are things that are, that are not as clear as other people would have you believe. And there are great examples of things that shouldn't happen. And then there are great examples of things that should. Just as a follow-up to his question, you literally knocked on the doors of every company that you sued last Almost year? Almost everyone. Yeah. Almost everyone. Yeah. But clearly a majority. Oh, yeah, vast majority. Clearly a vast majority. Yeah, we sent letters to every one of them because it's a bad idea. Here, let me give you an example. If I sue you and you ultimately pay me $2 million for a license, I can expect that somewhere between a half and two thirds of that money is going to go to the lawyers and the legal system, which means I'm losing a tax. And that's before I pay taxes on my income. Yeah. So I pay 50 to 70% to the legal system, and then I pay the US government taxes on my income that's left. 
versus if you simply pay me a reasonable royalty, we don't have to pay any of those people. I'll take a fair price because we can determine in advance what a court is likely to award me anyway at the end of the game. So we can, with a great degree of certainty, come up with a fair, in fact, I, we've often said to people, we'll go to binding arbitration day one. Day one. Let's just go to binding arbitration, pay us fairly. We'll take it. Yeah, I, okay. We're let's, not getting any binding arbitration. <laughs> can we take, let's take one more question, and then this is absolutely it. Uh, you mentioned earlier that in 10 to 15 years, we'll, we'll find ourselves in a world of oversaturation with communication, and I think we're definitely on that way. Um, in a world where there's oh, um, in a world where there is that oversaturation of communication, what's to prevent another dot com boom and bust? I mean, what's going to differentiate all of these upcoming entrepreneurs that are getting involved in the internet world? Like, what's going to make these businesses that are online effective and innovative? No, nothing. Yeah. So the, you can be absolutely sure there will be other booms and busts. Human nature, at least as far as we can tell, is not in danger of being rewritten. So people's desires to fantasize, people's desires to imagine things that aren't there, to see patterns that don't exist, whether they're constellations in the night sky or new areas of business growth, those things are not going away in any scenario that I can imagine short of re-engineering what it means to be human which is certainly on the horizon, but probably not in our lifetimes. But hey, I've been wrong before a few times. So as long as you have humans in the game, you're going to have this pattern of, you know, of irrational exuberances and overinvestment, and you're going to have people chasing their tails, and you're going to have panics and booms and busts. Those things are a function of human nature. They're not a function of markets or even regulatory uh, safeguards. Nothing like that ever is going to, that I can see going to matter, unless we re-engineer what it means to be human. That's a real possibility. You know, probably the greatest invention of the 21st century. Yeah, it's a real possibility. Probably the greatest invention of the 21st century will occur towards the end of the century where we can download our minds into a non-static media, you know, into a, into a, a non-organic media. So it's clear that your brain is it's just an electrochemical machine, right? It's got storage circuits. It's got processing circuits. It, it, it looks like a mystery because we're ignorant. It's not a mystery because it's magic, all right? Mm -hmm. So we know that the brain is functioning according to rules and processes, and, and there's, there's, a, there's a machinery of the mind. It is likely that we will, assuming that there isn't a meltdown of civilization, it's likely that we will figure out how to transfer that essence into a non-organic medium toward the end of the century. That will be probably the greatest change, of, that will probably be the greatest event of the 21st century in the same way that one might argue that the greatest event of the 20th century was to learn how to harness the information processing power of non-organic forms. Our ability to, to manage, manipulate, store, and move information, whether it's television, radio, computers, all those things, you know, was probably the greatest thing of the 20th century, the greatest thing of the 19th century was probably the invention of electromechanics and the idea of motive power and the steam engine and things of that sort. That, the idea of transforming force was the great invention of the 19th century. The idea of, of information as a process that can be managed was the 20th century. The 21st century is probably going to be where we figure out how to not be stuck in this wetware thing we're stuck in and start to hybridize between the wetware that we build and the wetware that we're born with. Almost certain. Cool. Thank you, Jay Walker.